Um, but uh, hopefully that it kind of wraps up some of those loose ends that we still have. So we will step into the This looks kind of like a raft, which you have to take if you're going sailing. <laughs> mine are weird. <laughs> you're like, the movie yeah, channel, yeah. but mine are weird. <laughs> Double standards. Yes. If you give me these, I can get there. I'm not going to like, be like, I'm not going to like, pull that out. Oh, yeah, screw that. Good afternoon. I know you guys have been waiting for this through your entire fall break. Um, anxiously, anxiously awaiting um, the Lampanites. So I'm Shannon, and this is Elizabeth. And we are presenting an entire family that was segregated from the rest of the periodic table to hang out by itself on the bottom. And Yeah. 
covered in 1886 by a French Um Turgen is named after that small Swedish village that um, Shan mentioned where a lot of rare earth metals were found. And it was discovered in 1843 by a Swedish chemist. Um, um, it means hard to get, and it was discovered in 1886 by a um, French chemist. Holminia, it was named after Stockholm, and it was discovered in 1879 by a Swedish chemist. Yeah, Swedish um, Urban, named after the same Swedish village, it was discovered in 1843 um, by a Swedish chemist. Lillian, it was after an ancient name for is, is an ancient name for Scandinavia, and it was discovered in 1879 by a Swedish chemist. Um, Euterbium, it's named after yttrium and erbium because of its it's got similar characteristics to both of those elements. It was discovered in 1878 by a Swiss chemist. Um, Euterbium was named after the city of Paris. Um, it's an ancient name for the city of Paris, and it was discovered by a French chemist in 1907. Mm -hmm. So now that you have met each of the elements individually, um, again, all of the elements were separated from the same mineral or the same types of mineral that Mosley used to prove that they existed. And as you can tell from the laundry list of Swedish and French chemists that discovered that were um, Credited with discovering each individual element, Mosley was not among them, even though he was the very first, first person to prove that all 14 of them even existed. These elements, um, again, were first classified as rare earth because they were so hard to um, obtain. And people assumed since they were very hard to extract from these minerals that they were found in, that they were exceptionally rare. Whereas this can be very misleading since, as far as we know, the lanthanide elements have a practically unlimited abundance. And by that, we mean that um, all of the minerals that are pulled out of the major mining parts of the um, world contain every single no lanthanide in the series. So every mineral that's pulled out of the ground has some abundance of each. The term lanthanides was originated from the very first element in the series. Good thing we are all not named after our first one. Mm. <laughs> um, these are a couple examples of the minerals in which the lanthanides are found. First we have um, monazite, and this contains mostly the lighter lanthanides. <coughs> and again, because they're a family, they all are really close-knit, like to hang out together. So not only does it contain mostly the lighter lanthanides, but it contains every other member of the family as well. This is currently mined in the United States and Malaysia. Then we have xenotime. Xenotime contains most of the heavier family members, but again, they're a family, they hang out together. So not only does it have a higher concentration of the heavier family members, but it has every other member of the family in there as well. Um, Usenite, um, that's how I've decided to pronounce that. Um, <laughs> this contains an even number of every single one of the 14 members of the family, which makes it um, very rare. Some of these minerals are um, exceptionally expensive because when you pull them out of the ground, they can actually be polished and they're absolutely gorgeous. You know, if you like rocks and dirt. <laughs> um, so these elements, once again, were very exceptionally hard to isolate because they had no idea in the beginning that there were separate elements in the minerals that they were finding. So in order to obtain these elements, the minerals have to go through a separation process. And this spawned the entire, um, the entire uh, process known as separation chemistry, which is actually still a um, separate modality of chemistry in general. Um, the very first thing that they did in order to remove them to isolate a lot of the minerals was a selective oxidation or reduction, depending on 
which um, of the lampanites that they were trying to extract out of the ore that contains all of them. Um, we've decided in modern chemistry that that method is really unpredictable. We're not sure if we're getting everything out of it. So currently, the method that's used to isolate the um, mineral into the individual lampanites in the series is an ion exchange method. It can use, most commonly they use a cation exchange column, but an anion exchange column works as well. And how this works is, um, it's just like the chromatography columns that we've built, except there's a um, anion or cation, there's a charged part um, that's in the silica matrix that um, allows the smaller elements to have more of a sticking time to the columns. So the heavier things move first because the larger radii of the heavier elements um, gives them less attraction to the anion or cation exchangers within the column. Okay, um, some of the common trends with lanthanides, one of the main ones that people know is the lanthanide contraction. Um, this is where the three plus ion of the, all the lanthanides um, gets decreases um, across the family. Um, and it does this like, it's a real significant decrease more than you expect. And this is because when it has a three plus ion, it's lost its bi one 5D and it's two 6S electrons. So all there is is a 4S or 4F, um, which has poor shielding and everything below that, which is poor shielding. So the Z effective is rather large. Um, and then a few other a few other trends are that the atomic mass, the melting point, the ionization energy, and the electronegativity all increase across the across the period. Um, and then the radius and boiling point both um, decrease. So the boiling point kind of has a bump that goes down, and then halfway at um, gadolinium it goes up and then continues to go down. And then the reactivity. Um, these are very electropositive elements, so they like to react with oxygens and halides. And halides. Um, the lighter rare earth metals, lanthium through samarium, will oxidize or tarnish in air readily. And then the heavier ones, gadolinium through lutetium, um, they're very stable in air. And then some of them, promethium, samarium, europium, and cerium, will ignite in air, like if it's in warm air. They'll just ignite in like 100 degrees Celsius or above. And then um, ytterbium is noted that it reacts slowly in water, and europium is said to be the most reactive of them all. So, um, all of our lanthanides, once we separate them from the mineral that they're found in, can be exceptionally useful. Um, the organic reaction that's up here is one that I spent a lot of time looking for for my organic synthesis last year. Um, it is one of the few reactions that I could find anywhere that will make a cyclopropane um, onto, or make a cyclopropane at all. Um, it took me quite a while to find this, so I'm very excited to share it with you. And this does use um, one of our, one of the lanthanides in the series um, with, in the process, and, and draw out the whole mechanism, because frankly, I did not look that up when I was doing my organic synthesis. <laughs> um, the lanthanides are also um, very prevalent in our green energy industry. They're used in the um, turbines for our wind and hydropower, and they're also used um, for the tidal, tidal power turbines that are coming out. Um, this, um, the elements in the family can also be found in glass and ceramics. They're used a lot in tinted glasses that people wear. Um, I did find something that had an interesting use of them. There are those glass glasses that will get darker when you go outside and lighter when you come in. Um, uh, some of that coating is made, has a fraction of the of a lanthanide in it. And from 
what I understand, most of them um, will work in it, so they just use whatever one is cheaper on the market at the time. Um, they're also rather prevalent in UV resistant glass. And we have a closing video for the, if I can hit the right button, series. And since we are ending the periodic table. And now, ASAP Science presents the elements of the periodic table. There's hydrogen and helium, the lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon everywhere, nitrogen all through the air, and oxygen, so you can breathe in chlorine for your pretty teeth, neon to light up the sign, sodium for salty times, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, then sulfur, chlorine, and argon, potassium, and calcium, so you'll grow strong, scandium, titanium, vanadium, and chromium, and manganese, this is the periodic table, the whole gas is stable, Halogens and alkali react aggressively. Each period will see new outer shells of electrons are added, moving to the right. Iron is the 26th, and cobalt, nickel, coins again. Copper, zinc, and gallium, germanium, and arsenic. Selenium and bromine, and what krypton helps light up your room? Rubidium and stonium, and yttrium, zirconium, niobium, molybdenum, technetium, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, silverware, then cadmium and indium, tin cans, antimony, then delirium, and iodine, and xenon, and then cesium, and barium is 56. And this is where the table splits Where lanthanides have just begun Lanthanum, cerium, and praseodymium Neodymium's next to promethium Then 62 Samarium, europium, gadolinium, interbium Dysprosium, chromium, erbium, thulium, interbium, lutetium Hafnium, tantalum, tungsten, then we're on to be Osmium and iridium, platinum, gold to make you rich till you grow old. Mercury to tell you when it's really cold. Thallium and let them visit for your tummy. Polonium, acetine with nabiami. Radon, radium will last a little time. Radium, then actinize the A9. This is the periodic table. Noble gas is stable. Halogens and alkali react aggressively. Each period will see new outer shells. Electrons are to the right. Actinium, thorium, protactinium, uranium, neptunium, plutonium, americium, curium, arcanium, californium, isinium, fermium, and olivium, nobelium, lauritium, rutherfordium, wm, swickium, boreum, lysium, luminarium, narcidium, marcantium, cumbertusium, unnatrium, flerovium, unimentium, livermorium, unaceptium, unamortium, and then we're done. Like the song? Be sure to check it out on iTunes and Bandcamp. Links are in the description. So, in case you did want to listen to it every day, my child does. And that gets stuck in your head like you know tomorrow. <laughs> Is that why I'm confused? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I noticed that. So this should be that the larger radii means more attraction because the lighter atoms have a larger radii. So that's why the heavier ones elute first is because the smaller ones are larger. So they're more attractive to the column, not less. I will apologize for that <laughs> right now. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> Sure, this is fleece. It, it stands out yeah, a lot. I know. Fleece. It does. I've been shedding so much. Okay, so just put it on the corner of the desk. Okay. Once we um, I think we left off for hydrogen right about here. We were talking about all the different things that we could do with hydrogen. Why it's so cool. Atoms in the 
ions, right? You can have all the different kinds. Um, you can take actually hydrogen gas and you can react it with nitrogen to fixate it into a cause to make fertilizer, plastic, all the amines. Um, coming up with synthetic ways to do this rather than biological ways is a um, significant area of research and doing it without huge inputs of energy. We can also take hydrogen and use it for fuel. We're going to get for fuel cells. Um, you can take fats and you can hydrogenate them, either making trans fats or cis. Um, so the good stuff or the bad stuff. So we've got margarine on there. Um, you can react hydrogen with um, carbon monoxide and get feedstocks. So alcohols, because we know that alkanes don't react very much, so we want a hetero atom on there. So we can react carbon monoxide to hydrogen to get something um, that we can go forward with. Lots of energy input there. Okay. So the most important is um, hydrogen is fuel, and trying to figure out how to make this economically viable, and how to um, go about figuring out how to store hydrogen is one of our biggest challenges. So they keep talking about a hydrogen economy, figuring out how to store large amounts of hydrogen that could um, fuel a car is an issue right now. Um, in order to go about 300 miles, which is kind of the, the goalpost of how far you have to go with a car um, before somebody will buy it. If it's less than that, nobody will buy it. Um, so, but the tank would have to be about the size of a full-size pickup truck. Just the fuel tank, <laughs> even as compressed gas. So, not really working there um, to um, go that much distance. So instead they're looking at hydrides, they're trapping the hydrogen within um, hydrogen um, cells, um, and then also the generation of hydrogen as you need it is probably the direction that we will go in the future. Okay. So um, there is this lovely link to fuel cells and how they work. Um, compounds, I think we looked at this, mm -hmm. the different colors. Yeah. So molecular saline, metallic hydrides, lots of our different kinds. And so there is the reactivity beyond combustion. So heterolytic cleavage, that means breaking it evenly. So the electrons actually go with the hydrogen. So H minus, um, so lithium hydride, sodium borohydride, which we have been using in the lab, and continue to use. Then there's homolytic cleavage, so even, you make H radicals, um, very useful for substitution reactions in organic, but it can also be done with metals, so we can have a 10. Um, or we can do heterolytic cleavage in the opposite direction, where the hydrogen loses all of its electrons, becomes H plus. So kind of two electrons on hydrogen, one electron on hydrogen, zero electrons on hydrogen. Those are the kinds of forms that you can find hydrogen in. So that's our synthesis. So that was hydrogen from the other day, okay, so from a long time ago as it seems right now. And, uh, um, and then that's the Questions? <laughs> Questions on hydrogen? No? I don't know. There is, if you haven't read your book, there is an entire on all the periodic table and the elements. Great resource as you're reviewing um, different things. So, you might want to read it. Okay, so then next, I said it's a crazy day, lots of different things. So our checklist of what we're doing today. Elements, lanthanides, and hydrogen. Let's take our quiz, because I don't want to get it done. <laughs> Makes me feel a little better. Okay, so no talking for a minute. I'll take those quiz on the beginnings. Don't forget to question me.
Go to the bottom, go to the bottom of the page. It doesn't take very much more time.
more seconds. Okay, pass in the quizzes, please. Pass out. So pass right the quizzes, pass left the handouts. <laughs> Or silicon silicon. I don't think it's a P. Because it's, is it? I don't know. A silicon arsenic. Wait, what's an a P? A P semiconductor. A P. Yes. Okay, so somebody come up with an example? for that. Um, we could also draw them kind of side by side where we're seeing a p-type semiconductor here and an n-type on the other side. So without an applied voltage there's positive charges and negative charges and nothing's happening. No electrons are moving. If we <coughs> apply a voltage, that's B here, where the positive side is by the p-type, and the negative side is by the n-type, we're going to see a flow or a movement of the electrons towards the holes. So we're going to get a current that is going towards the positive, right? Because the electrons are moving towards the positive charge. Electrons represented by the negative. C shows that electrons don't move in the right direction for a diode if we reverse the potential. 
So if we put a negative over here, uh, yeah, the, ca the cations will come this way, but nothing else will happen, right? There's no movement of uh, current there. So here, if we apply current in this direction, or if we put, apply potential, the diode stops the current. If we're forward biased, the voltage is applied correctly, it'll allow the current to flow through. So what this does in um, electronic systems is that it allows the movement of electrons in one direction only. So there will be no electrons, and then once we get to a certain voltage, then it should be that current can flow infinitely and really fast, no resistance. In reality, this um, current diagram doesn't look quite like this. It doesn't go up quite as fast as we would like. And there is some potential voltage back here where it gets strong enough that you actually overcome kind of the barrier. There is some movement, right? That negative charge is going in that direction if you apply a huge potential, okay, a huge voltage. Because of that, um, this is the symbol for a diode. This is what they really look like, like we're a little round thing. Um, and they flow in the direction of the arrow, but then the line says they don't flow that way. Okay. Um, they can use, be used as rectifier signal generators, oscillators, all kinds of um, useful electronic properties. Okay. So if you're building your own electronics, you use lots of diodes. I just take a class where I have to build electronics. That's part of my chemistry degree. You can build <laughs> One of the diode applications is to actually use diodes as photoelectric or photovoltaic cells. So a simplified picture, um, we have the sun shining, and that's actually going to apply our voltage. And so we've got um, our N-type uh, semiconductor, right? Phosphorus doped in this example. And then our P type of boron doped um, semiconductor, and they're kind of in two layers. And then there's electrical leads that connect them. And so we get electrons flowing from the N type to the P type, and it provides um, the ability to use that electricity. Another photovoltaic cell in campus? Big ones? On top of that quadrant, you put a big solar panel array. And so this is kind of the current generation of how much uh, energy is being generated by the photovoltaic uh, photovoltaic cell. So how much they're out. It has little things to tell you how it works, but um, you'll be more sophisticated than the little picture of how it works. So, so is all of it usable energy? But the there is some loss. Cells yeah. There is some loss because there isn't um, that infinite resistance, and then it, we're not immediately using the energy, so we have to then rely on battery storage. Okay. Um, so. There is some <laughs> That's why they're always developing new photovoltaic cells. Most of the time right now that means putting a third layer in between um, so that you get better absorption of the light and, um, and then you can have better treatment. So if the one type is on literally on top of the other type, they're stacked together. So if we took kind of the side profile, then it would look like that diode picture. Um, from the last one, where the P-type is on one side, the N-type, and then you get the flow of current. And here we've got visible, but it doesn't have to be visible. We can um, use all kinds of light. So a lot of space applications don't use visible light. Uh, they can generate more. We have better materials that can absorb um, in different ranges. Then we can use some for light emitting diodes, right? Another diode. 
Um, so it's really the same picture, right? P type, N type. Here they just colored in the N holes rather than putting negative charges. And so here's our diode symbol. And um, which direction is current flowing? Towards the negative is moving towards the positive. So is this right? No, this is backwards. So let me point that out to you. <laughs> and but this picture is more of our band diagram that we drew, so I'm just reminding you of the band diagram where we have the conduction band, the M type that has extra extra electrons, and then there are holes that are just a little bit lower. So um, what we can do is they can transfer from the N to the P, right? So the electrons move from having extra electrons to fill a hole. And when that happens, because there is a decrease in energy, it puts off light. And so that's how they can um, generate light, by, by actually having that current flow through them. The color of light that you get depends on that band gap. And so the bigger the band gap, the higher the wavelength, so, you know, we use LEDs for TVs, right? We have the trio of different colors. Notice we don't really have a yellow. Most of the time we don't make good yellows. There's not good green yet. So usually we rely on red and green to make all of our colors. Not quite as bright, because those are not Pregnant colors, but okay. Next application quantum dots. It's another semiconductor. All we're doing is making them spheres and making them really small. So, up here we have our typical MO diagram of a molecular solid, right? There's so many atoms that we have a, um, I don't know, it would be a density state where we'd see kind of a loop there. Density is really high in the middle. But this is our whole band, and that is our valence band. And then we have our band up at the top that's our conduction band, and the gap between them is the band gap. You see how that's the picture that we've been drawing um, for semiconductors, not the doped ones, but the silicon. Once we start making these semiconductors in small spheres, it doesn't have to be a sphere, but that's what we are good at making, then we don't have an infinite num number of atoms to fill that band diagram. It starts to become more discrete at all levels. And so instead of looking like this entire cloud of in thing, we have a density of states here, but then we kind of have a few more discrete levels. And if we make them even smaller, we've got less material, we have even less states. And we make them even smaller, even less states. So as we make them smaller, the band gap increases we're filling less states, it's coming closer um, to the middle less because we have less overlapping orbitals. In order to emit, what we have to have is we have to have an electron come from the valence band up to the conduction band. Maybe it goes all the way up to the top, maybe it just goes to that first level, it doesn't really matter. It goes up to the conduction band and then it comes back down and that produces luminescence, or that produces light. And so if we have a 5.5 nanometer sphere, we're going to see orange light, because that gap is, is a certain size. If we have a 2.3 nanometer, the gap is bigger, so we're going to see blue light come out. So this is a table in your book. I don't expect you to actually be able to see it. But all of these are intrinsic semiconductors, and they have band gaps 
that are known, and you can get a wavelength of emission based on the size of the nanoparticle. I don't want you to know what size produces what color. No, I don't care. I want you to know how quantum dots work and why they deviate from our MO picture. Okay. This is actually pictures of uh, cadmium selenium um, quantum dots. And so we have the big quantum dots all the way down to the small quantum dots. What's that look? Um, right now, what we could do is we can use them as a luminescent material in lots of imaging applications. So right now we're using the uh, quantum dots to look at imaging. They also provide some really interesting basic quantum um, properties because the wavelength has to actually match the size. And so they're doing some really interesting quantum mechanics using nanoparticles. Or nanodots, quantum dots. But at first they just made them because they were cool. <laughs> I mean, it's just interesting to think that you can do this with gold nanoparticles as well. Gold looks like gold, but not when it's um, a quantum dot or a nano crystal. It actually has the full color of the rainbow based on the size. Okay. <laughs> Make me purple. Gold. Material that has a quantum dot that is like a band gap. So just make it the proper size so the band gap is the right. Yes. So These are all. Any semiconductor can be made into little um, dots or nanocrystals that then have the different size. Now, making them is sometimes <laughs> hard, right? So cadmium um, sulfur or cadmium selenium ones are pretty easy to make. They actually have pretty good protocols on, okay, add this surfactant and you'll get this size, stir it this long. It's a little bit of magic, you know, because they've just determined it experimentally how to make them. Um, if you were starting from scratch, it would be a lot of trial and error to make all of the different colors all of the different size nanocrystals. They use um, diffraction to tell you what size your nanoparticles are. Are they all the same size, right? If it wasn't all the same size, you might get a mix of colors. So there's some technical things that are hard, but we could make it out of any of Questions? All really cool applications of semiconductors. All really frontier research areas um, that come out of the inorganic understanding is just the basics of your MO diagram, and those band gaps, what the Fermi level is. Those are just traverses. Um, the other thing that I can do was.
if I was to study for this test, I would take all of these things and say, okay, what is the question that she is going to ask about this? <coughs> okay, so let's start. Emma, MO diagrams. Okay, so you have to draw an MO diagram of solids. Given any solid on um, the table, draw an MO diagram. Now, which ones does it make the most sense for? Metals or metalloids, it doesn't really make sense for um, covalently bonded structures because they're discrete. They're not infinite number of atoms. We do have some, you know, as we get to the metalloids, you can have large structures. So metals and metalloids. Labeling the Fermi level and the band gap, the valence and connection bands. What happens if you heat them up? So maybe you draw an MO diagram, then you draw one once you've heated it up. Because what happens, the electrons move from one level to another. Then density of states, which one is the density of states one again? That is the MO diagram or the band diagram where you draw the boxes. <coughs> Okay, density of states is the hoops. Okay. And so the density of states that would go like this would be very even. They would look, okay, those are not super even, but um, <laughs> they're about the same. The density of states can be individual S and P <clears throat> orbitals, or they can just be a combination of S and P orbitals, and this is just the valence and conduction. ways to write them. If it's a combination S and P or both, it doesn't usually look as even as this. It looks like that. So you really have P and S overlapping. And then you have the same here. Remember, this is just number of states. So it's just saying, okay, well, I have a lot of density right there, or I have a lot of density right at the top um, in this diagram. But we assume we have so many atoms that there's states throughout this whole thing, which is why it breaks down when we get less atoms and we get to quantum ones. Let's see. So then you have to draw semiconductors. And MO diagrams for those, remember those start inserting P and, and bands. Okay. So go through and ask questions. If you don't know what kind of question I would ask, come see me, write me an email, I can tell you what kind of question I would ask. The elements, you are only going to be asked short answer questions that are from the student presentation, but then there will be matching questions that I wrote. Okay. And there's an example of those. Don't focus on the date things were discovered or who discovered them. We want more of the applications, the uses, what's cool about 